He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. <gasps> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 popular movie myths and misconceptions, whether moments within the films or merely related to them. I'll never let go. Number 20. A person died looking for the money. Fargo. What Shep told us didn't make a whole lot of sense. Oh no, it's real sound. It's all worked out. You want your own wife kidnapped. Yeah. The film Fargo is a darkly comedic caper involving a substantial amount of ransom money. In one scene, Steve Buscemi's character stashes the cash on the side of a road in the snow. The money remains unfound by the film's end. I just don't understand it. A few years after the film debuted, a Japanese woman named Takako Konishi was found dead in Minnesota after passing through Fargo. Some incorrect reporting at the time of her death led to the false claim and later urban legend that she died searching for the hidden money in the mistaken belief that it was real. This myth even gave rise to a film of its own called Kumiko the Treasure Hunter. I discover treasure right here. Number 19. A Death in the Chariot Race Ben-Hur the climactic chariot race is a major centerpiece of this legendary religious epic. In it, Judah Ben-Hur races against his childhood friend turned foe, Masala. Ben-Hur triumphs after Masala's attempt to kill him backfires. For years, rumors persisted that the stuntman for Masala actually died during the filming of this sequence and that the death can be seen in the finished film. However, no one involved with the film has ever mentioned any accident during the making of this scene. These sorts of myths around race scenes are fairly common, but as one of the most famous in cinema history, the one from Ben-Hur has been particularly persistent. Number 18. The Final Matches Outcome – Rocky Given that it's one of the most popular sports movies ever made, you'd think everyone would know the story of Rocky. But arguably, the most crucial part of the first film in this storied franchise has a major misconception about it, because Rocky actually loses. Plenty of people assume that Rocky Balboa wins his match against Apollo Creed. And there's the bell for round one, the most publicized fight of the ages. The fighters come out, come into the center of the ring, looking at each other. Rocky just looking. And while Rocky does give Apollo one incredible fight over 15 rounds, Creed is ultimately declared the victor by split decision. Perhaps this myth has remained because Rocky's story is an underdog story. Here it's chaos. Rocky, you went the distance. You went the 15 rounds. How do you feel? All right, four. What are you thinking about when that buzzer's on uh, for that one? Thank what you think about when the So many other underdog stories result in the plucky up-and-comers triumphing despite the odds. And while Rocky does succeed in proving himself, he doesn't technically win. <laughs> Number 17. Gremlins After Midnight – Gremlins Everybody knows the rules with gremlins, right? Ready? One, two, three. Right, right, no, no. Right, right. Don't put them in light, don't get them wet, and don't feed them after midnight. Well, not really. Despite gremlins being the name of the film, these famous rules are for the Furby-like Mogwai. Feeding these adorable creatures after midnight is what turns them into gremlins in the first place. That's a real gremlin in my kid! However, for people who only know the movie through pop culture or who only saw it once, the name Mogwai just doesn't have the same name recognition, which is probably how this misunderstanding came about. <laughs> Number 16. Edna's Inspiration – The Incredibles this animated superhero film is loaded with fun characters, but superhero fashion designer Edna Mode is a fan favorite. It will be bold, dramatic, yeah. heroic. Yeah, something classic, like uh, Dinah Guy. Oh, he had a great look. The diminutive diva walks all over everyone else and has some of the most quotable lines in the movie. I used to design for gods. Many viewers have long believed that Edna is based on Oscar-winning costume designer Edith Head, given their similar hairstyles and glasses. However, according to director Brad Bird himself, 
Edna Mode is not based on anyone in particular. She's her own thing. Like Edna's many creations, her design feels familiar, but she's still wholly unique, darling. There it is. The room is yours. They are lucky to be in your presence. Now the turn. Yes, you are a tiny god. <laughs> Number 15. Jack could have fit. Titanic. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> Everyone's probably had this argument. The end of Titanic sees Jack and Rose in the water with Jack floating on a door. Well, actually, it's an elaborate door frame, not a door. But the point is this. A lot of us have angrily believed that Jack could have survived if Rose had just moved over. I'll never let go. I promise. However, as seen in the film and in several recreations after its debut, two people on wreckage at the same time would have capsized it instead. Now, if they had just traded off with each other, that's a different story. Number 14. Singin' in the Milk, Singin' in the Rain As one of the most acclaimed films of all time, Singin' in the Rain has had plenty of rumors about it bandied about over the years. I'm singin' in the rain, just singin' in the rain. What a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. One of the most bizarre is about the legendary sequence with the eponymous song. While Gene Kelly is well, singing in the rain, one myth goes that the rain on set was actually milk. The theory goes that milk was used to make it show up better on camera, given that Technicolor was relatively new. However, Kelly's widow, Patricia Ward Kelly, has flatly denied this absurd idea. Plus, it's not like Singing in the Rain was the only movie to have rain on film. It wasn't over. It still isn't over. Number 13. Do you feel lucky, punk, dirty Harry? Clint Eastwood has made a career of playing grizzled badasses. Every gun makes its own tune. One of his most famous roles is as the titular not-so-clean cop Dirty Harry Callahan. When Harry confronts various criminals within the film, he utters the immortal signature line, Do you feel lucky, punk? Or at least that's how just about everyone misquotes his line. His actual line is far more involved and comes at the tail end of a speech. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? While parts of this misquote are in the two questions he asks the criminals, the exact wording most people use is merely paraphrasing the actual quote. So you've got to ask yourself one question. Do you misquote it? Well, do ya, punk? Now you have to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do ya, punks? Number 12. George Lucas directed all three, the Star Wars original trilogy. Even if you're not a hardcore Star Wars fan, when you ask most people, they'll tell you that George Lucas wrote and directed the original Star Wars trilogy. Use the Force, Luke. Let go. Except he didn't. Well, not all of them. It's true that Lucas scripted and directed the original 1977 classic that originally bore the franchise's name, but he was not as fully in control with The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Lucas helped script the latter, but the screenplay for Empire was written by Lee Brackett and Lawrence Kasdan, and it was directed by Irvin Kirshner. Meanwhile, Kasdan helped write Jedi with Lucas, and it was directed by Richard Marquand. The Star Wars universe was Lucas's overall vision, but he didn't do everything. Number 11, Background Ghost, Three Men and a Baby. One of my favorite movies ever, Three Men oh. and a Baby. This 80s comedy features three guys roped into taking care of an infant girl dropped on their doorstep. The birth father is one of them, Jack. Whoa, these diapers are way too big. What size did you get? They're ultra-absorbent. The more absorbent, the better, if you ask me. In a scene where Jack discusses his new daughter with his mother, an urban legend claims that the figure of a ghost can be seen behind some curtains in the background. However, the figure is merely a standee, a cardboard cutout of Jack, who is an actor. The standee was largely cut from the final film, though you can still see it in a few shots. Even co-star Tom Selleck has debunked the rumor, and we don't want to refute a man with a mustache that impressive. I thought it was always like a, a poster, a full-size poster that had been knocked over. 
Yeah. That it, was my theory. It actually is. It is a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson. <laughs> Number 10, Brandon Lee's death, The Crow. Brandon Lee was the star of The Crow, playing the protagonist Eric Draven, and died during filming. During a scene that called for a gun to be fired, a dummy bullet was left in the firearm and was not properly removed, as the gun specialist had gone home. When the gun went off, Lee was shot for real and died later in the hospital. However, despite popular belief, the take in which he was fatally wounded was not used in the final cut of the film and was in fact destroyed after being used in evidence in the investigation into the accidental death. <laughs> Number 9. Jason Voorhees is the Killer, Friday the 13th Jason Voorhees is the famed killer of the Friday the 13th franchise, but he wasn't always. In the first installment, it's actually Jason's mother Pamela that kills teenagers, taking her revenge not only on the two camp counselors whose negligence led to her son's apparent death, but also on counselors decades later, too. Look what you did to him! It wasn't until the second film that Jason himself became the primary antagonist. And he didn't even acquire his iconic hockey mask until the third film. It just goes to show that while a property can become associated with one thing, it's not always representative of the whole. Don't let her live. I won't, Jason. I won't. Number 8. Sequel. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. What a vivid imagination. It's a common misconception that the second film in the original Indiana Jones trilogy is a sequel. After all, that's generally how trilogies work, with one following the next. However, like the pulp adventure serials that inspired them, Indiana Jones doesn't follow a strict overarching narrative. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is actually a prequel, taking place the year prior to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Apparently, writer George Lucas didn't want Nazis to be the villains, and made the film take place prior to Raiders to avoid the hero running into them twice in a row. Though the Third Reich would return in the third film. Nazis. I hate these guys. Number 7. Tim Burton directed it, The Nightmare Before Christmas. This is Halloween. Given that it's often titled Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, the general public can be forgiven for assuming that Burton was in the director's chair. Given Burton's track record of whimsical yet creepy movies, it seems right up his alley. While Burton did create the story and characters and co-produced, the screenplay and direction were handled by others. This year, Christmas will be ours! <laughs> Burton's name was likely attached for marketing reasons since he did provide the seed of the film's idea and was already a big name by that point, both in the industry and with cinemagoers. The actual director, however, was Henry Selleck, who went on to direct James and the Giant Peach and Coraline. Small world. Number 6. Shelved Because of Shame, The Day the Clown Cried. And in terms of that film, I was embarrassed. In the early 1970s, comedian, actor, and director Jerry Lewis directed and starred in a movie about a clown imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II. Lewis was reportedly embarrassed with the end result, which is often cited as the reason for the film's lack of release. However, in reality, The Day the Clown Cried was tied up in legal issues once it was completed, with the rights being retained by the screenwriter Joan O'Brien, which delayed and ultimately halted its release. That being said, Lewis's embarrassment may have played a part in its continued lack of exposure. In 2015, a copy was finally given to the Library of Congress, but even they cannot screen it until 2024. Are we going to ever gonna get to see The Day the Clown Cried? No. <laughs> Number 5. Sunglasses. Risky Business. The most famous scene from Risky Business has protagonist Joel Goodson, played by Tom Cruise, celebrating his parents' free independence at home. He dances around to Bob Seger's old-time rock and roll in nothing but his underwear, a white shirt, and sunglasses. Or at least that's the way every parody of the moment shows it. In the original scene, Cruz wears a light pink shirt and has no sunglasses. While he wears the sunglasses prominently in the poster and in other scenes in the film, it's likely that his look outside of the scene is so iconic that everyone misremembers Cruz wearing them in this one. Or it's a Mandela effect. But that's another list. No, no, but you can get, get out. Well, I get think out. it could be fun. No. Number 4. 
bigger boat, Jaws. This blockbuster is important and iconic in pretty much every way. However, when it comes to quotes from the film, arguably the most famous one is also one of the most frequently misquoted. In the famous scene, Martin Brody is throwing chum behind Quint's boat and spots the massive shark they're hunting. Retreating into the cabin, he tells Quint, You're gonna need a bigger boat. However, most times the scene is referenced in other media, people say we're gonna need a bigger boat, or whatever else they need something bigger of. Sure, it has pretty much the same meaning and effect, but it ain't a direct quote. We're gonna need a bigger boat. Number three, hello Clarice, the silence of the lambs. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Since we're on a misquote streak, here's another imaginary line everyone thinks is real. Over the years, whether in scripted pop culture references or just regular movie fans having conversations, the silence of the lambs is misquoted. Hannibal Lecter is remembered as saying, hello Clarice, in his menacing greeting to FBI agent in training Clarice Starling. However, although it's become iconic, it isn't accurate. Good morning. Hannibal's greetings to her in the film are limited to a good morning and a good evening, Clarice. Good evening, Clarice. Sure, he says the exact phrase to her in the sequel, but that was a decade later. Silence of the lambs. Hello, Clarice. It's good to see you again. Number two, Luke, I am your father. Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. No! Back to the original trilogy. You'd think it'd be hard for people to get something so famous so wrong, but if you search your feelings, you'll know it to be true. Despite being one of the most oft-quoted lines in film history, the phrase, Luke, I am your father, is never actually said by Darth Vader. The line is, no, I am your father. No, I am your father. The misremembered line has, through misquoting and paraphrasing in pop culture, become so prevalent that people mistakenly believe it's actually present in The Empire Strikes Back. But like Play It Again Sam from Casablanca, it isn't. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, SEX in the sky, The Lion King. Can you feel the love tonight? Midway through this Disney classic, Simba the Lion flops down on a cliffside and knocks up a cloud of dust. When played back very slowly, the dust appears to form the vague outline of the letters SEX. Religious organizations have used this as an example of Disney's apparent lack of morality. And the supposed message has been the subject of playground rumor for decades. However, the generally accepted explanation is that the letters are actually SFX, a common abbreviation for special effects, and were inserted by someone from that particular department who worked on The Lion King. What mook made that up? Oh. <laughs> yeah, pretty dumb, huh? Is there a movie myth we were wrong for excluding? Let us know in the comments. Go ahead, make my day. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.